you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, we are going to look at the Christmas story today. The Christmas story. I want to encourage all families, before you open presents, that you would read the Christmas story uh, to your family. And I'm all for everything about Christmas, the lights, the gifts, the candy. Man, the good stuff. We've had three fellowships this year, or this week, excuse me, and uh, I appreciate all of our classes and had a staff party Friday night and had a wonderful time. But folks, Christmas is about Christ. Christmas is about Jesus' birth. And we want to talk to you today about God's greatest gift. God's greatest gift. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us in the outline, number one, the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ. Number two, the glory of Christ. Wherever Jesus is, folks, there's glory. There's glory. And then the joy of Christ. And I think of all the things that are missing in our world, the joy is the thing that we are missing. Because, see, there are a lot of happy people out there, but there's a difference between happiness and joy. Okay, happiness depends on circumstances or happy things happening to you. Happiness comes and goes. But the joy of the Lord, the Bible says, is our strength. We as Christians should have joy in our lives. We have something to have joy about, and we are going to share that with you. You know, I never get tired of reading the Christmas story, which is the true reason for Christmas and the celebration of Jesus' birth. Caesar, uh, Augustus Caesar was ruling the Roman Empire, but God was in charge of Jesus' birth. Mary and Joseph had to travel 80 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem because uh, Rome took a census every 14 years for both military and tax purposes. Each Jewish male was required to return uh, to the city of his fathers to record his name, occupation, his property, and his family members. Old Testament prophecy told us that Jesus would be from the tribe of Judah, of the lineage of David, born of a virgin, born in the city of Bethlehem, all which proved to be true in our scripture text today. Let's look again at this awesome story of Jesus' birth from Dr. Luke's perspective. It is truly the greatest story ever told. Number one, the birth of Christ. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And registered, folks, simply means taxes. And I know what it means. I don't like paying taxes. Now, none of us had like that, but I mean, it's been going on for years and years and years. And this census uh, first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. It was a requirement. Everyone was required to do this. Verse 4, And Joseph also went out of Galilee, uh, from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was from the house and lineage of David. You have to understand, from uh, you know Jesus' birth in the Gospels, from Malachi to Matthew, it was 400 years of silence. And so you can imagine, and you have to picture this in your mind, what a glorious birth this was. And while they were going, and, and you know, the 80-mile trip, you, you have to realize, folks, she was fixing to have a baby. She was probably riding on a donkey. It would have been very uncomfortable for her. And you know God had all this planned, okay, that she made that 12-day trip, okay? That's how far it was. And you remember, Bethlehem means house of bread. And of course, the bread of life was birthed at 
Bethlehem. There's so many details in the Christmas story that we miss. But God had a plan. God's plan was prophetically spoke of. And folks, I am telling you, if it's, a, if it's prophecy, uh, because it is written by God, it will come true. And so we see they left, us, left uh, Nazareth, went to the city of David, and, which was Jerusalem, and Bethlehem was five miles from Jerusalem. And verse 5 says, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, we talked about that last year, or last week, uh, there was in those days especially a one-year period that they lived with their own families, even though there was a ceremony, even though they were considered married. And, and folks, it, to me, it compares to our engagement period. By the way, while we're here, folks, don't get in a hurry when you get married. You don't know somebody, and I know every once in a while it works out. I met them, you know, and three months later we got married. But you need to know who you're married. That one year, I mean, in my heart of hearts and in my counseling, I always, you know, I always encourage them to wait one year so that you can know this person. Then the Bible says, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And you have to realize, even though this is the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords, Okay, he was going to be buried, he was going to be born in a stable, and she bought, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And compared to our days and how and what we do as far as birth, I mean, you think about it, ladies. You have several trips. To your doctor. When the water breaks, you go to a hospital. Everything is clean. Everything is sterile. Okay, you give birth. They have monitors. They have all these things going on. They have clean sheets, clean rooms. Okay, all this. So you could even see in this, folks, I'm telling you, God was protecting his own son and laid him in a manger. And there are even people uh, that believe, I know a couple of Bible scholars I've read uh, that they believe it was more like a cave, actually, than, you know, the manger scenes that we see nowadays. But whatever and wherever for sure it was, I am telling you, it wasn't a normal place of birth. And do you know what that tells me? It tells me Jesus didn't come in as a king's son all right, he, uh, he identified with the lowly and the humble. And not just that, folks, the first people that were told about the birth of Christ were shepherds. And shepherds in those days, I'm telling you, it was one of the lowest things of occupation, okay? So he didn't come in, Jesus didn't come in with this pomp and ceremonies and these celebrations, he was born in a stable or a cave. And here's the last part of that, because there was no room in the inn. Folks, is that not true today? There's not any room for Jesus in our lives. There's not any room for Jesus. Uh, it just seems like in our world, even though this is the closest thing other than Easter that we stop and we celebrate, Jesus' birth. There are a lot of people that do not believe in the virgin birth, and we told you last week how important that was. And so we see here history being made. And when I thought of history this week, you know what history means? His story. Jesus' story. His birth, which I believe was the most important birth ever been. And the birth of Jesus Christ was the best gift ever been. Look at the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7. Hold your finger there and go with me to Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7. This was 700 years written before 
the birth of Christ, 700 years. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We see, we, we have just sung about that. Emmanuel means God with us. That day, that day of birth, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came down. I'm, I'm telling you, he, he was there. He was inside of Mary, I, and I know all that. I understand the nine months, but he literally became Jesus, the Son of God. Now go to Micah chapter 5. Let's look at another prophecy. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you uh, come forth, shall come forth to me. Notice the capitalizations there. Okay, that all says about deity, about deity. The prophet Micah was talking about Jesus and was talking about God. The one, notice the capital again, to be ruler of is ruler in Israel, who's going forth are, are uh, from old and from everlasting. Folks, Jesus always was. God always was. They were not created beings. Even though he came down to earth as a man, him and God were one. Therefore, he shall give them up unto the time uh, that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. One of my favorite Christmas carols is Silent Night. In Silent Night, every time I hear that song, it reminds me of peace. Peace. Oh, folks, this world is looking for peace. And the birth of Christ truly brought peace on earth and goodwill towards man. So we see here the birth of Christ, but also I want you to see the glory of Christ. The glory of Christ. Look at verse 8. <clears throat> now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And again, shepherds, uh, you know, while it was a lowly op occupation, uh, they could not go into the temple because they were considered unclean. Uh, they were out for weeks and months at a time. Uh, they had a reputation of being kind of mean and feisty and probably not taking enough baths, you know, to the city people. You know, when you think of a shepherd in those days, okay, it was about as rough as it comes. But again, I think God and and you know, for, for choosing. Folks, God chooses things and people for a specific reason and a purpose. And what we do is we, we really, we're bad about stereotyping people. We'll look at some, somebody or so, something that they have on and we'll think something. And folks, we shouldn't do that. Folks, everyone is important to God. Everyone he uh, created was wonderfully created. And then verse 9, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And again, I believe it was Gabriel, because Gabriel was the messenger of announcements. Okay, he was going to announce Jesus' birth, and the glory of the Lord sh uh, shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. I don't know if you've ever seen the glory of the Lord. Okay, and again, it doesn't have to be a bright light. We associate that with a bright light. But folks, when somebody gets saved, the glory of the Lord is present. It's present. Why? Because that person was bound for hell. That person was lost. That person didn't have peace in their life. That person was seeking 
And folks, to find Jesus Christ is the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life. So the glory of the Lord shone, and they were greatly afraid. Now, the second thing about shepherds were they were tough, okay? They were the ones fighting off bears and other things that would want to get after their sheep. They're the ones that had to dive in the rivers when the sheep got in there and their coat got so heavy that they would literally drown. They're the ones that had to, you know, uh, live off the land and be by themselves and out, at, you know, at night and in darkness and all these things. So when it says shepherds were greatly afraid, I'm telling you, it was, it was this thing that had never happened before. I mean, these shepherds were just out doing their job and boom, here comes a bright light. It scared them. Then the angel said unto them, <laughs> not only was there a bright light, they literally heard an angel. I'm hoping before I die, I hear an angel. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? Just be sitting there and some angel just start talking to you. That is a cool thing. <laughs> then the angel said to them, do not be afraid. All right? When you have to tell shepherds not to be afraid, I'm telling you, they must have had a frightful look on their face. A deer in the headlights, let me put it in our language. For behold, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Don't you like good news, folks? Don't you like good news? Good tidings. Something's fixing to change. Good tidings. Oh, folks, I know today it may seem dark in your life. Today it may be a difficult week in your life. Today it may seem as if, you know, things couldn't get any worse. But I'm telling you, the good tidings of great joy is Jesus. It is Jesus, which will be to all people. Why did Jesus come? Folks, he came to die for all people. He didn't care where you were born. He didn't care what you did. He didn't care where you live or what you drive. Folks, he came for everyone. Hold your finger there and go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. talking about salvation coming to earth in the person of Jesus. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him to the, from the dead, you will be saved. Why did Jesus come? Folks, he came to save the world. To save the world. He is our Savior, capital S. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And it's done through prayer. For the Scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon the name. Back in those days there was a huge gap between Gentiles and Jews. Jews were kind of known as the religious people, the religious folks, and Gentiles uh, were the outcast. But I'm telling you, Jesus came for everyone. Salvation is for everyone. Look at verse 13. For whoever, what does whoever mean? That's everybody, folks. God's sending his son was for everyone. Everyone, it doesn't matter your nationality, doesn't matter the color of your skin, doesn't matter the language that you have. Jesus and God wants you saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord, it said it again, shall be saved. Oh, folks, we have a great opportunity this Christmas that is sharing the good tidings that we just read about. That is sharing from our heart why Jesus came to this earth. Oh, folks, Christmas 
C-H-R-I-S-T, christ must. We need to be sure Christ is in Christmas. And the Bible says in verse 11, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God came, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God in human flesh. Verse 12, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And I would love to have been there that night. I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, a lot of times I put myself first person in the situations that, that I read. All right? I mean, one of my favorites is Jonah. Can you imagine being in the belly of a whale? That, that, you talk about a bad day. That's a bad day, all right? But to be at the birth of Jesus, to see Jesus Christ as a babe would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Folks, I love it when we can see God's glory. See God's glory. And we see God's glory every time we look in the face of Jesus. See God's glory. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John 1, I want to mention Jesus in his ministry. When he began, began his ministry, verse 10, the Gospel of John 1, 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him. That's why I say he was always there. Matter of fact, verse 1 says the same thing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. You can put Jesus right there, and you would not, I'll be misinterpreting Scripture. God was in creation. Jesus was in creation. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, and the world did not know Him. Folks, there's so much of the world that don't even recognize who Jesus is. They don't even acknowledge Jesus Christ. There's some people that don't even celebrate Christmas. And folks, they are missing out on the greatest gift ever given. They're missing out. And he came into his own, and his own did not receive him. We're talking about Jesus here. He lived, and he was rejected by his own people. But as many as received him, to them gave, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. We were talking about salvation in Romans who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born again literally means born from above. Jesus came out of heaven. Jesus came from the throne of God. And he came. He was birthed for you and I. And then here's his purpose. And the Word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Folks, you want to see the glory of God? Get in His Word. You want to hear about the glory of God? Study the Word of God. Every day, every day, every day as a Christian, we need to be in the Word of God. Why? Because we can see Jesus in the pages. We can see God in every page. And if you want to see the glory of God, spend time in the Word. And the Word, Jesus became flesh as the only begotten, which means there never was one like Him. There never will be another son, S-O-N, like him. 
full of grace and full of truth. What is grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. What is truth? The Word of God. Do you realize that grace and truth was also born that day? In a stable, a Savior who is Christ our Lord. So we see the birth of Christ. We see the glory of Christ. Now let's see the joy of Christ. The joy of Christ. So it was when the angels had gone away uh, from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Folks, they had an assignment. God told them where baby Jesus was. And the key here is being obedient. Folks, we need to listen when God speaks to us. We need to obey when God tells us there's something we need to do. And that's exactly what the shepherds did. The announcement was by the angels, and then the shepherds said, hey, let's go, let's go uh, to Bethlehem and see this. Verse 16, and they came with haste. That means they were in a hurry after seeing these angels, after hearing this announcement, they got fired up. They got excited. They were enthusiastic about what had happened. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger, just as God had said. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And folks, what do you do with great news? Man, when you get great news, you want to share it with everyone about you. You want to made widely known. That means they started when they left the angels and the light and the glory of God. They were fired up, and I'm sure they just kept asking questions and saying, hey, you, you can't believe what happened to us today. You can't believe what happened to us last night. All right, they were telling the story, and people around them were getting excited about that. Widely known meant all the way there they were saying it, and all the way coming home they were saying it. And it was saying, verse 18, and all those who heard it marveled. Marveled. I love that word. When you see marveled in the Bible, it is associated with the impossible. This is not normal. Folks, Jesus' birth was not normal. It started with a virgin birth. The the world doesn't even acknowledge that. They don't even think it can happen. But as we studied last week with God, all things are possible. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Now look at verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. What was Mary? One thing, I believe she was humbled, extremely humbled by being the mother of Jesus. The second thing I think she was, was she she knew right along, all I'm telling you, from the time she gave birth and held baby Jesus in her arms. She knew there was something different about this baby. Oh, I know. The announcements had been made. I understand she had found favor with God. But until you hold that baby in your arms, until you hold Jesus, the Son of God, folks, I am telling you, I believe it totally changed Mary. She was on assignment. She had a purpose in life. Her purpose was to be the mother of Jesus. And she saw as Jesus was growing up some of the things that he had done. You know, you remember when he was young, he went to the temple and 12 years old, and man, he was just talking to the scholars and going back and forth and They were going on home and traveling, and they lost him. 
Okay, and what did he say? He said, Mom, I've got to be about my father's business. When the first miracle that Jesus had done, Mary was trying to explain it, and Mary knew that Jesus was, was different. And basically her advice was, whatever Jesus tells you to do, just do it. Folks, wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be good advice for us? Whatever Jesus tells you to do, just do it. So Mary pondered these things in her heart. And then verse 20, then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as was told to them. Oh, folks, I love this part. Shepherds glorifying and praising God. Folks, this is what we should be doing today. This is what we should be doing this Christmas season. We should be glorifying God with everything we do. And I love, I love the Christmas hymns. And man, didn't the children do a great job last Sunday night? They did a super job last Sunday night. And I can't wait for tonight. I've heard bits and pieces. And folks, you are going to miss a blessing if you're not here tonight. They were glorifying God. They were praising God. And, and they kept telling, kept telling. And folks, the first witnesses of Jesus' birth were shepherds. It wasn't the religious folks in Jerusalem. It wasn't the king of that day. He used shepherds to get his message out about the birth of Jesus. So what does he want us to do? Folks, he wants us to do the same thing this Christmas season. We have another week. We have another week, and we shouldn't do it just at Christmas time. I understand that. But I'm telling you, there's something about Christmas where people are more open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 10. Back in Romans 10, look with me. And we close with these scriptures. These three scriptures. Romans 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on Him whom they have not believed? Folks, there are a lot of folks that do not believe. They are not believers. Somebody needs to tell them about the birth and life of Christ. And how shall they believe in Him whom if they not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? I'm telling you, even today, folks, you can go home and you can call someone. You can invite someone to come with you to the Christmas program tonight. You can invite people next Sunday, which is Christmas Day. Invite somebody to come with you. And look at verse the rest of verse 15. And how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Is this not exactly what the Christmas story spoke of? Peace on earth, goodwill to men, good tidings of great joy. Folks, we need to make it a lifestyle. We need to take advantage of the Christmas season and share with everyone we come in contact with. And then another example is in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, early in Acts, the church was on fire. Thousands of people were saved. There was a humming and a buzzing around the glory of God was in this church that was on fire for Christ. And they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. Think about this. Some of the best witnesses were shepherds who were the same thing. Okay, the lowly. When you're looking at the chain, the job chain, it's as low as you get. And then he takes fishermen and makes them disciples. That's why it tells me, folks, the gospel is for everyone. It is for everyone. And here's the word I said, and they were uneducated, untrained men. They marveled. Folks, if you want to marvel some folks, if you want to just blow some folks away, tell them about the story 
of Jesus. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And then skip down uh, to verse 18. Matter of fact, they had threatened them before, and they said, man, y'all got to quit. you you got to quit t- teaching about Jesus. They told Peter and John, you, you are being too loud. You're being too obvious. Okay, we don't want to hear about your Jesus. And look at verse 18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak it, speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it is right in the sight of God, sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. What did the shepherds do? They seen and heard the holy angels. What, did, what have you done if you're saved? You have seen and you have heard from God and from Jesus. We are first-hand, personal witnesses of the miracle of Christmas. If we have been saved, if we have invited Christ in our lives, and we need to share that with all around us. Then Revelation chapter 5, if you don't do it this Christmas, there is a day that you will worship. You will worship. Look at chapter 5, verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the land, and each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us by God, to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. There it is. The gospel is for everyone. And have made us kings and priests to our Lord God, and we shall reign on earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels and the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice. You talk about a big choir, Steve. That is a big choir. You know what's cool about that? We're all going to sound good. We're all going to sound good. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive a power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. Oh, folks, look what we have in Jesus Christ. Look what we have. We have Holy Spirit power. We are riches beyond monetary things. We can find His wisdom, strength, and honor. And we are blessed beyond measure. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard them saying, blessings and honor and glory and power be to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Oh, folks, I can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait to see the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I can't wait to sense the Holy Spirit. And folks, the Holy Spirit is strong. It is strong in our church. People tell me that all the time. Guests tell me that. But can you imagine being in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Well, folks, we have someone to worship. He was born in a manger, a lowly birth. But I'm telling you, when he rules and reigns during that millennium period, he will rule with an iron fist. He will throw Satan into the depths of hell when all is said and done. That's our king. Verse 14, and then the four living creatures that amen. Amen means so be it. When you say amen in a service, you are literally saying so be it. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives 
forever and ever. I got a card, or Lori and I got a card this week. And I'm just going to read the cover. And we get, thank you, thank you for all the cards, everything. Y'all are so kind to us. Y'all are so kind, so giving. But it was called God's Love. It's not long, but it says, Long ago, one silent night, God revealed His glory bright. His own image came to man for salvation's matchless plan. Jesus, Savior, Shepherd and King, Lord of all to you we bring. Praises, wonder, thanks and love for this, for this gift from God above. Jesus Christ sent His only Son to die for you and I. If you don't know Christ today, I am telling you, you may have presence under a tree, but it is not even close to the best gift that you can receive today, and that's the gift of salvation from Jesus Christ our Lord. If you are a Christian and Maybe you need to rededicate your life today. That's why we have a time of invitation. That's why we have the prayer altars. You know, and when you come down here, it doesn't mean you got a huge problem or, hey, if God tells you to come and pray, just come and pray. Maybe you're here today and need to follow the Lord in baptism or want to join our church. Whatever God tells you to do, I pray that you would do it during our time of invitation. Father, thank you. Thank you for the birth of Christ. God, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful night. Thank you for the message of the shepherds. Thank you that, Lord, we can all testify about Jesus' birth. God, I pray this week, and I know there's pressure on folks, but God, I pray that we would just take our time this week that we would spend some time in the Word, and that we would just look at you and see what you have done for us. God, I pray that we would have a heart of gratitude. God, the miracle birth, the virgin birth, Almighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, chose us. So God, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for the Christmas season. God, I pray that we would be like the shepherds and like the apostles, letting others know of the greatest gift ever given, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And God, will give you the glory and the honor and praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?